Hi, and welcome back. This is part 2 of the Easy Roads 3D Side Object Tutorial Series. Part 1 was all about the Mesh Object Type of Side Object. We saw how this first side object type can be used to spawn a prefab in the project folder along a spline path with a range of additional options for both prefab childs and also for positioning, alignment, and rotation of each instance. Today, we are going to look at the procedural mesh object side object type. This type is also based on a source prefab input, a model created in a modeling app and imported into Unity. But for this side object type, the original mesh will be deconstructed and based on their original position, the mesh vertices will be regenerated repeatedly exactly following the spline path. So this will result in a smooth, uniform, procedurally generated mesh matching the original source mesh input. Let's have a look at this and create a new procedural side object. We name it Procedural Mesh Example. And we select Procedural Mesh Object. Here we see similar options as for the Mesh Object Side Object type. Standard Unity Game Object options like Layer, Tag, and Static. For this side object type, we also have scale options. Generally, the model will already be imported at the correct scale, which is also recommended, but here it is possible to scale it up or down anyway. We can also set if the object should cast shadows, and if the normal should be recalculated instead of using the original mesh normals. Usually, you want to keep the original normals. We also have the default active state for each marker option. We explain this in part 1. When active, the object will be generated along the full road by default. When inactive, it will initially not be generated at all. Instead, the side object will appear after activating it for specific markers. This state is useful when the side object will only be active on a small number of marker sections. We can set the category. We will use the concrete barrier prefab, so no need to change the category. The barriers category is already selected. Here we have the source object option. This is where we assign the model that we want to regenerate. We can drop the concrete barrier model in the source object slot. The mesh is instantly extracted. That is how easy this is. It is an automated process. This refresh button can be used after changes to the source object. It will redo the mesh extraction. So at this point, the side object will already be generated after activating it on a road. Let's create a new road and activate this side object. As mentioned, the mesh is repeated along the spline path, smoothly following the road. Although the current default settings could be used, it is not what we are looking for in this case. What we want is to have this middle section repeat, and only put these two sections at the start and end. We can achieve that in two ways. The first option is by cutting the mesh here in the Mesh Editor window. the model will appear in top-down view. If that is not the case, then try one of the other axes. We can activate the start end sections here, and move the respective handles to where the mesh should be cut. Press the left mouse button and move the handle. The start and end sections will be clearly highlighted. The handle will snap to vertex positions. For a detailed mesh, you may want to zoom in a little bit. We can use the scroll wheel, right click, drag vertically, or alt plus drag vertically to zoom in. We can hit the Z key to put focus back on the full mesh. It is important that the handle offset is at a position that will result in a clean cut with no triangles intersecting the offset. See how we have a clear edge across the mesh from left to right at the cut offset.
all triangles below the start offset will be part of the start section. All triangles above the end offset will be used for the end section, and all triangles in between the two offsets will be used for the repeated midsection. We press the apply button. Scene instances will automatically update. Now we only have this part at the start, the middle section is repeated, and the end section is only used for the very end. So this is one way to cut the mesh. The second way to define these start, middle, and end sections is by setting up the model so it exports with the three separate sections as child groups. By using the underscore start, underscore middle, and underscore end naming convention in the child object naming, the system will automatically extract these sections and generate the side object accordingly. The advantage of this approach is that start and end sections can overlap the middle section, so more complex and creative shapes are supported this way. An example of this in the demo scene is the concrete tunnel side object. The start and end sections intersect with the repeated middle section, here we can see these child objects with underscore start, underscore middle, and underscore end in the name. Let's select the start object. This part will intersect with the middle section. The middle section will connect here according to the relative position between these two objects in the FBX file. And in the scene, this is all generated according to the setup. Another side object for which this approach is used is the stepped wall side object, which is an example of a more advanced procedural side object. Apart from the start, middle, and end sections, it has a setup with additional underscore step up and underscore step down sections. These naming conventions are used as a trigger to generate the side object at a fixed height by repeating the stepped wall underscore middle section up to the point where the height difference with the spline path reaches the offset detected in the step up and step down sections. At that point, the respective step up or step down section will be inserted and the wall continues at a new fixed height level, and so forth. The visual end result is this stepped wall pattern. Here in the inspector, we can see that the system has indeed extracted these sections. It also shows the detected height offset between the default middle section and the step down, step up transition sections. Let's go back to the concrete barrier example and continue with the inspector options. Here we have options to spawn additional objects along the spline path. We can set different objects for the start, at each segment connection, and at the end. The chain link fence side object is an example of this. The fence posts are added as separate objects, so the start object will be spawned at the start of each section. The connection object for middle sections will be spawned at every X repeated section. The default is 1, which is also used for the fence example. But this option can for example be used for bridge pillars to extend the distance between pillars and avoid that they are spawned every repeated section. Here we also have alignment options. None will align the spawned connection objects according to the horizontal spline path direction, with no rotations on the X and Z axis. When inherit is selected, the spawned objects will align with the same orientation as the procedurally generated section at that position. And the end object will be spawned at the end of each section. So we can add additional objects at the start and end of each procedural generated section. These options are useful to spawn instances of detail objects, possibly with LOD levels, rather than have them all added to the procedurally generated mesh.
we already covered the Mesh Editor window when we showed how we can set Start, Middle, and End sections. Let's continue with the Control Settings. Clamp to Row Geometry When this is active, the repeated sections will clamp to the row geometry. Instead of regenerating the mesh relative to the original mesh bounds, this will be done relative to the road resolution. This can be useful for low poly roads, for which the side object should align exactly with the road geometry. Note, this will require a source mesh bounding box size that more or less matches the road resolution, otherwise the procedural mesh sections will be squeezed to the extent that it may not look good. The other controls are similar to the options we have for the other two side object types. We already fully explained this in part 1. See the direct link below in the description. We can position the object relative to the center of the road, or relative to the road sides. And when it is positioned relative to a road side, we have the dual sided option, which will generate the side object on both sides of the road. The same for the X position and Y position options, which work in a similar way for procedural side object types. But here we have more options to randomize the final shape. We can randomize the X position according min-max ranges. These position changes will take place over customizable min-max distance ranges. All this does not really suit this concrete barrier side object, but it can be useful for example for guardrails and fences to add variation. Let's enter some small random X position values for the guardrail side object. For this side object type, you probably do not want these changes over too short distances. These values are probably still too strong for a guardrail type of side object, but you can see what it does. Here we have the same randomness option for the Y position. Small random heights will make the side object look less computer generated. Here too this could be used for guardrails. Have the posts randomly slightly below the terrain for height variation. And here, we can also add random sideways rotations. This too is useful for example for side objects like guardrails and fences to add damage. As mentioned before, by using subtle min-max range values, all these options will make the end result look more realistic and less computer generated. You can also experiment with larger values, for, in this case, more damaged guardrails. Let's deactivate the guardrail and reactivate the procedural mesh example preset we created, and continue with the side object manager options. These offset options also work similar as for the mesh object side object type. We discussed that in part 1. The same for snap to terrain. See direct links in the description. In part 1 of this side object tutorial series, we looked at the alignment options for mesh type of side objects. The path forward and normal options are especially useful for the procedural side object type. The rotation will follow the road which is useful for this type of barrier and objects like guardrails, especially in hilly areas. Let's change the road shape in a more extreme way so this becomes clearly visible. When none is selected, these edges are vertical and not aligned with the road direction. When we change this to path forward, we see that these edges are now aligned with the road direction. Let's have a look at what this looks like when the Path Normal option is selected. We don't need the wireframe shading mode for this. We can go back to the original road shape, and we will add road tilting. See how the orientation of the barrier is upwards? Also in the tilted area, we will now select Path Normal for the alignment. Refresh the side object on the road. 
we now see that the barrier aligns with the tilted road section. The path normal option should also be used for side objects like additional flat road shoulder objects at the road sides at the road level. These objects should exactly follow the road, also in tilted areas. And in regard to that, possible random road tilting should also be taken into account. Side objects like road shoulders or dirt strips on the road should align with the random tilting as well. That is why you want to select path normal for this type of side object. Combine sections. By default, a mesh will be generated for each section on a road. This combine option will merge all sections into a single mesh. The last options are collider related. We can add a mesh collider or a box collider. The mesh collider speaks for itself. The generated mesh assigned to the mesh filter component will also be used for detecting collisions. Alternatively, we can use box colliders. The size will match the bounds of the extracted sections, and optionally, the collider can be scaled. A value of 1 represents the collider mesh bounds. This scaling could be useful in hilly areas to make sure the boxes overlap, since it is impossible to have them exactly match the shape of the generated mesh section, which will not have a perfect rectangular box shape. After refreshing the side object, we can see by the green bounding box edges that indeed box colliders are now used for collision detection. So that is how you can use your own models and create unique procedural side objects, not only along the roads, but also as separate objects. It turns Easy Roads 3D into a complete versatile scene building tool. The demo package includes various examples that can be reviewed. This concrete barrier, guardrails, the tunnel objects, a bridge overpass, fences and walls. The last two can also be created as separate objects, no roads involved. Just like, for example, this power line, completely unrelated to roads. More complex power lines are also possible. This particular power line can actually also be done with a shape type of side object. We will look at that in part 3. And if you are experiencing any issues getting one of your own models to work well, then you can always contact us. We will be happy to assist. You can contact us through our website, see the link in the description, or by email. See the various readmes in the Easy Roads 3D root directory in the project folder. For now, that's all for the procedural mesh object side object type. Be sure to subscribe and get notifications of the future tutorials. And if you enjoyed watching this tutorial, please give it a like. Let us know. We will see you in part 3 about the shape type of side object. Thanks for watching. Bye.